Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once more, another third program, and uh, I guess you've all had your coffee. You get through the break line, and we're glad to be back. Genesis chapter 18, again, where we left off in our last program. And uh, again, we just want to welcome our TV audience, and again, thank you for everything that you do on our behalf, the prayers and your gifts, everything. And uh, we've been on a lot of seminars lately, and what a joy to meet people person to person. And uh, I guess the favorite word we hear is, I watch you every day. That word every <laughs> just sort of puts the frosting on the cake. There, there's a gentleman right there, and uh, we like that, that uh, they get interested in the word, and uh, not less feldic, but it's the word of God that uh, is interesting. All right, Genesis chapter 18, we'll start back at the beginning again, and we're still talking about the theophanies where God, the Son, steps out of the invisible Godhead and becomes then a visible appearance to these men and women in the Old Testament. And uh, remembering, of course, that once we get to his birth at Bethlehem, which we call the incarnate, which I didn't realize until the other day is not a biblical word. You know, we got a lot of words we think are biblical and they're not. Trinity is one, sovereign is one, and this is another one. You don't find the word incarnate in the scripture, but all the things that it pertains to are. So anyway, uh, once we get to the incarnate Christ after his birth at Bethlehem, then we'll have no more theophanies, don't need to, because he now appears in a literal physical body. All right, so Genesis 18, we have another theophany, verse 1, where the Lord, now here it's all four capitalized, so it's Jehovah, God the Son, the great I Am, and he appeared visibly. The, uh, uh, I can't even think of the word myself, optometry is taken from it, and uh, the Greek word, if you look it up in the Strong's, means to appear physically. So the Lord God the Son appeared unto him, that is Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, which is down there south of present-day Jerusalem, toward the area of Beersheba. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now this is Middle East. This is desert. And, of course, Middle Eastern customs have been the same for centuries upon centuries. And so part of the desert culture was hospitality. And so when strangers came by, it was only natural to offer food and drink. And so this is what you have here. You have a typical Middle Eastern act of hospitality. Abram had no idea, or Abraham now, he had no idea who these three men are. All right, so he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men, doesn't say angels, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, bowed himself to the ground, and said, My Lord. Now, as I mentioned the last half hour, this was merely a, a term of respect and uh, recognizing a stranger and giving him welcome. He said, My Lord, if now I found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fed. Now, I don't have to tell you, water is the chief commodity in the Middle East, you know. And uh, we, we find that out, especially some of the time we've been over there, and the Sea of Galilee is way, way down. And then we were clear down at Petra. You remember that, honey? And here was water all the way down to the to the far end of Petra and the washrooms and everything were still flushing. And I asked one of the guides, I said, where in the world, here we are in the middle of the desert, where do you get the water? Where do you suppose? Sea of Galilee. That was all part of an agreement between Israel and Jordan that Israel would provide so many millions of acre feet of, or millions of gallons or so many acre feet of water from the, from the uh, Sea of Galilee, even though it was drying up and they would not relinquish those contracts and so uh, you got to remember Israel has to put up with an awful lot that the world knows nothing of but they kept their word provided the water but uh, my point is made when you get into the deserts of the Middle East water is preeminent all right so he said let me fetch a little water wash your feet rest yourselves under the tree and I will fetch a morsel of bread comfort you your hearts after that you shall pass on see he wasn't expecting anything more for therefore you come to your servant, and they said, So do as thou said, so he does. Now, I don't know how in the world he got a calf dressed and fixed this quick, but maybe they were there longer than we thought. 
But anyway, they, uh, they made quickly three measures of fine meal, kneaded, made cakes upon the ark. Now verse 7, And Abraham ran to the herd, fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man, and hasted to dress it. Took butter, milk, the calf which he had dressed, set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree. Now this really blows you away. And they did what? They ate. Now we know who these three men are. Abraham didn't. But knowing that they're angels, doesn't it kind of throw a curve at you that they ate? But they did. Well, if I had time, we'd go all the way up to Christ's resurrection body. And you remember on uh, one of those mornings, the guys have been fishing all night? Yeah, heads are nodding. You know what I'm going to talk about. And he asked them, have you caught any fish? No. We Oakies would say, skunked. Didn't get a bite. And you know what he did? He said, throw the net on the other side of the boat. And they came in. But in the meantime, what did he already have cooking on the fire? Bread and fish. And then it goes on to say that what did he do? He ate in that resurrected body. Now, those are all just little tidbits of information, you see, that enlighten us on some things that when we get into the eternal abode, yes, we're going to be able to eat. There won't be any need for sanitation and so forth because it's going to be a body that will totally consume whatever it eats, evidently. But here we have it again, that even these angels, one of whom, of course, is the Lord himself in a an uh, theophany, he ate. That's what the book says. All right, and so they did eat, all three of them. And they said unto him, where is Sarah, thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. Now again, I always have to stop because these come from experiences. One of the early trips we made to Israel back in about 1975, and we could still go just about everywhere. There was no intifada in those days. And one of the places we stopped was a, um, an Arab sheikh and his tent clear out there on the desert, way out beyond even Beersheba. And... Uh, had this big tent in the front. Of course, I'm sure it was a tourist trap, but whatever, it, it, it made good tourism. And so we were about 30 people, and so we get out and go in this old big open tent, and the sheikh is fixing coffee, if, if you could call it that. Ira still turns up her nose. But anyway, the amazing thing was, while we were sitting there in the tent, there were about 30 of us, 24 little Arab kids were all over her, just all over her picking at her hair and looking at her rings. And so where in the world could 24 kids come from? And the old man just made one bark after a little while, and they all disappeared. Well, you see, after we finished our coffee and we were heading back to the bus, you see, all these kids come back again, and she was their main target. And so then we asked the guide, well, where do all these kids come from? Well, he says, look out behind. Well, there were four tents. What were the four tents? Four wives. <laughs> and so between the four wives, the old boy had 24 kids. But you see, that's Middle Eastern life. It's still the same. You go over to Israel today and you drive between Jerusalem and Jericho, you'll still see the Bedouin tents out there, black as coal, and that's their lifestyle. Well, it hasn't changed a bit in all the millennia of time. All right, so here's Sarah, no doubt, in her own tent behind the main tent. All right, and so he says, she's in the tent. Now then, verse 10, and he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. Now remember, how old is Sarah? Ninety. And uh, Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. Now there are the word, the Lord is used in a small l. Now verse 13, And the Lord, Jehovah again, God the Son, the Theophany, he said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Now are you picturing this taking place now like four ordinary human beings, five now with Sarah? Are you picturing it that way? Here we have all the appearances of Three wayfaring strangers, men, Abraham and Sarah. Nothing of an angelic uh, aura or anything about them. All right, so 
Sarah laughed. And verse 13, the Lord said, Wherefore did Sarah laugh? Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Now verse 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now I have to stop again. What do you suppose Abraham is now suddenly realizing? I've talked to this individual before. He must have looked different or he'd have recognized. I've talked to him before. When? When he appeared at the uh, time of the Abrahamic covenant. When he appeared unto Hagar and all these other times. And all of a sudden, I'm sure it just dawned on Abraham who he was really talking to. All right, now it even gets plainer as we go on. The Lord answers and says, verse 14, At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Now, stop and think. Who but God can make a statement like that? Well, nobody can, but God can. And he knew what he was talking about, and it happened, see? All right. Verse 15, so then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. Can't you hear her? <laughs> These people are just as human as anybody else. Now all of a sudden she's got to start backtracking. She's talking to the Lord of glory. No, I didn't laugh. All right. For she was afraid. And he, the Lord, said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, One of the three, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? See, there's a repetition of the Abrahamic covenant again. For I know him, the Lord says, that he will command his children and his household after him. They shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, and you all know what that was, I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of it which is coming to me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, that is, the other two of the three, and the Lord stayed there with Abraham. And Abraham stood yet before the Lord, God the Son in a, a theophany, a human form, face to face. All right, now you all know the account of how God and Abraham are going to discuss the future of this wicked city, Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, I think it's a good way to look at America today. We're getting closer and closer to this whole Sodom and Gomorrah situation. And I know I pray, and I want you to pray, well, Lord, if you despaired Sodom for 50 won't you spare America for a few million? I'm not saying he will, but I think it's a legitimate prayer that God will spare America for the sake of us believers. But then on the other hand, I have to remember, and I remember stressing it when we were teaching the book of Isaiah, even though there was a remnant of righteous in Israel, when God's wrath fell, like with the invasion of the Babylonians, were the believers spared? No. No. They suffered right along with the rest of the nation. So we have to take these things for what they're worth. But on the other hand, I love these verses just for that basis, that I can go to the Lord and I say, No, Lord, as long as there is a remnant of believers, can you spare America until we hear our trumpet, trumpet call, which we trust is coming close. In fact, I guess I can share this. When the Virginia Tech thing happened, of course, my phone rings off the wall. Well, what is all this? Well, yes, this is end time. This is signs of the times, and that's the way I've been starting most of my seminars lately, when the Lord confronted the Pharisees, or they confronted him. And what did he tell them? He said, you hypocrites, you can look at the sky this afternoon and foretell the weather tomorrow. Didn't he? That's exactly what he said. You look at the sky in the morning, and it's red and lowering, and you say, it's going to be a poor day. 
but he says you can't discern the signs of the time. Well, now, what was he talking about? Those religious leaders of Israel should have known on the basis of Old Testament prophecy that here we are now in the fourth of Daniel's empires, everything concerning the coming of Christ in his first advent was in place, they should have known that this was the promised Messiah. But did they? They didn't have a clue. Well, we're the same way today. My, we should be able to look at the signs of the times and know, beloved, that the end is upon us. But do they? They haven't got a clue. You know, I, uh, I guess I'll take time. Uh, I've got a lady up in... Uh, Twin Cities, Minnesota. I've been interviewed on her radio program more than once, and uh, she's on the same page scripturally with me 100%. And uh, she was interviewing a, I don't like to name names, but since it was on the radio and uh, there was nothing secret about it, he was a Lutheran pastor. In fact, he was the pastor of the huge church where we always hold our seminars when we're up there. And uh, she had called him in for an interview because she had heard that he had just recently come out of that replacement theology, covenant theology, and had recognized that indeed Israel was, according to prophecy, where they belong. And uh, so somebody taped it for me, and I can quote from that tape without apology. And she asked him, she said, now, pastor, he was a Ph.D., she said, now this will be playing in Minnesota, so I'll probably get feedback. She said, now, Pastor, she said, when you were in seminar, seminary, didn't you students ever talk about end-time prophecy? Never. Never. Well, she said, up until just then recently, didn't you ever get together with your fellow pastors and talk about end-time things? Never. She said, well, then what in the world got you to change your mind? Israel. See, and that's the point I'm constantly making. If ever there is a sign of the times, it's the nation of Israel. They're there. By no human endeavor, they should have never survived these last 2,000 years. But there they are, a miracle of history. And yet people cannot see it. But here we have it, that over and over, you know, the signs of the times should tell us something. So anyway, getting back to Virginia Tech, why do I call this the signs of the times? Well, the Lord himself says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Well, all right, now all people think of as the sign of Noah is the flood. But go back before the flood a little ways. What was the picture? The world was filled with what? Violence. You're going to see it with your own eyes? Come back. Come back. Genesis chapter 6. Because this, this is what we mean by the signs of the time. Not just necessarily the, the floodwaters, the destruction, but what was the moral climate of the world in general just before the flood? Oh, I guess I can find the first one real easy. Verse 13, but I thought there was another one. Verse 5, yeah, we can use that one. See, this is the moral climate. That's the best way I can explain it. Just before the flood. Verse 5 of Genesis 6, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented. In other words, made the Lord sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved me his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I created from the face of the earth, man and beast, creeping thing, fowl the earth, for it repenteth me that I made them. But then you come all the way down, verse 11. I knew there was another one. Verse 11. The earth also was corrupt. Oh, you see that word in the paper every day lately, don't you? Everybody is corrupt. The corporate bigwigs are corrupt. Politicians are corrupt. Everything is feeding on corruption. And it isn't just America. It's all over. My, the traffic in women and children, it's just sickening. But what's at the root of it? Corruption. 
men that are nothing but greedy for the filthy lucre that they can gain. All right, that was the way it was before the flood. Verse 11, the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with what? Violence. What's violence? Killing each other. All right, then come on down to verse 13. It's repeated for emphasis. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. In other words, I put it this way. To instantly kill all those innocent little children in the opening hours of the flood was an act of mercy. Because had they kept on living, what would they have finally succumbed to? Murder, violence, see? All right, but we're getting there fast. So whenever you see these horrendous acts of violence, whether it's in Baghdad or whether it's in Virginia Tech or whether it's in California, it makes no difference. It's just a sign of the times, beloved, that the end is getting near. Okay, where was I? Back in De Genesis chapter... Oh, 18? Back to Genesis 18. Now we'll start at verse 24. And we're going to pick this up. Now just, like I said, just picture ourselves in America today. Go before the Lord and, and just beg Him that, Lord, for the sake of the believers, spare America, because we know that judgment is coming. Verse 24, peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 that are righteous that are therein? Verse 26, I'll do this for sake of time. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. And Abraham, now evidently Abraham had a pretty good idea, don't you suppose? or he wouldn't have kept coming down. But now Abraham has said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, who am but dust and ashes. Now see, he knows who he's talking to, remember. He knows he's talking to the God of glory. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty. Will there be forty-five? Wilt thou destroy all the city? For even forty-five, or the lack of five from fifty? And he said, If I find forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again. Can you just, can you sense Abraham? My, how he was pleading. And he says, oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak, peradventure there shall be 30. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30. And he said, behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, peradventure there shall be 20. And he said, I will not destroy it for 20's sake. And he still keeps going. And he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but one more time. Per adventure, 10 shall be found there. And again the Lord said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. Now, isn't it amazing that in these cities, they were not new like New York, of course, but they were pretty good-sized cities for that day and time, and not even ten believers. Now then, in the verse I want you to see before we go on from here is verse 33. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and re Abraham returned unto his place. And, of course, the Lord went on up into the invisible again until it was time to reappear in another theophany. All right, now then to pick up the other two angels so that we know what we're talking about, you've got to go into chapter 19 for a moment. Here are the other two of the three in chapter 18. Verse 1, And there came two angels, the same two that ate with Abraham and the Lord back in chapter 18. And so those were all three heavenly creatures in what we would call a theophany. All right, now let's just jump up to chapter 26, and now we come to the next generation, and it's Isaac. And still, God is going to appear in human form and temporarily, and then go back up into 
the invisible Godhead. Chapter 26, in verse 1, and there was a famine in the land, the land of Canaan, not the same as the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Now, you've got to know your Old Testament geography. Gerar, of course, was on the border between present day, like Gaza and Egypt, down on that neck of the Mediterranean Sea. And the Lord, what's the word? Appeared. See, here we have it again, the same word. The Lord appeared all of a sudden in human form <coughs> out of the invisible Godhead. And he comes down, and he appears unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee. Now, I don't know how many of you thought of it any time all afternoon. How long does it take the Lord to travel from heaven to earth? <laughs> That's an ambiguous question, isn't it? But even on resurrection morning, on resurrection morning, where did the Lord go after he had told Martha, don't touch me? Well, he went to glory. He went up to the heavens. And he presented his shed blood as the atoning blood in the holy of holies in heaven. And then before time goes by, he appears again to Thomas and the rest of the twelve. Well, I wonder, how long does it take? Must be split second. And the same way here. I don't think the Lord had to travel hours and hours to come down and appear to these people. But uh, it's an interesting thought, you know, because one of these days we're going to make that same trip ourselves. And uh, it's not going to take long. And we're going to be translated from here to there. Well, anyway, we're not going to get very far with Isaac. But again, we'll do like we did before. We'll go as far as we can and we'll come back. So he appears to Isaac because this is an important change in, in everything pertaining to God and the children of Israel. He appeared to him and he tells him, go not down into Egypt. Now that was a specific instruction to Isaac. Go not down into Egypt. Well, he's, he's on the border, you see. He's not very far. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of, which was the promised land, the land of Canaan. Now verse 3. Sojourn in this land. Stay here in Canaan, and I will be with thee, will bless thee, and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.